Greetings friends, me Wayman, and man it's been a long time since I've been on. And two months, right? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, got the house, I'm on the porch right now, uh, shooting a video, not in front of the big bookshelf. I know, I, I love the bookshelf because I can just turn around and grab stuff off it uh, as I talk about stuff. But, it's just easier, it's kind of late at night, and uh, wife is getting ready for bed. So, I had to be noisy out here which is great it's kind of like my my sun porch and uh, at some point uh, I'll give you all a tour of the place because it's, it's pretty nice we got some uh, blueberry bushes come on on uh, out back and uh, pear trees are loaded so pretty nice but what I want to do is to come on and uh, go over a private message that somebody sent me and friends I gotta tell you it's, it's always uplifting uh, when somebody asks questions like these I love it and, and even if it's baited right baited questions to get in a big debate because there's nothing that I'd rather do than to debate uh, biblical literature religion philosophy all kinds of stuff it's, it's a blast and um, things get heated sometimes but that's the way it is and uh, this isn't one that's baited this is very sincere and uh, I'm going to read it and go over some things. This video goes out to this person. Didn't want his name mentioned. Uh, so I said, you know what? Some other people might be interested in it also. So I'm going to do the video on it. So, so this was on the topic of slavery in biblical literature. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read and then talk about certain parts of it uh, as we go through this. Um, but first... First off, right? Whenever you talk about religion, you should be drinking, right? So, I got my beer here. I'm ready. Yeah, let's see. Oh, yeah. All right, ready to go. So, so-and-so writes, I really enjoy your videos. I like the fact that you like literature, even though you don't believe. Some atheists are so hostile, it just makes you want to shut down and run. You should never do that. They just need big hugs, just like the fundamentalists. <laughs> I also dig the fact that you like books, period. You seem to be like a laid-back dude. I am pretty laid-back. Uh, I am writing you because I am wrestling with slavery in the Bible. To me, it's like the Achilles heel of moral dilemmas for me to face in the Bible. The way theologians dance around it, I know they are not on sure footing. So I went ahead first today. I looked up every scripture in the NLT Bible, New Living Translation, that mentions slavery. Not only is it mentioned, it's deeply woven into the theology and understanding of God from Genesis to Revelation. I found over 200 scriptures. To be honest, some of the scriptures made me almost faint. Now when I read phrases like Paul, a slave to God, a slave to Christ, and you were bought with a price, it takes on a whole new meaning. To say the least, the deeper I just got into the Bible, it's like a different Judaism and Christianity altogether. We are not even close to what it was written, and I'm sure you went through this as well. I hope after my study I can retain my beliefs. My desire is not to abandon them, but wait a minute, let's face it. If I say love the book, I need to know it. I got to face the giants in the book. So I'm going to stop there. That's, that's section one. Because he, he gets on to some questions. So with the topic of slavery and looking up the text, excellent. And, and I'm going to recommend an excellent Bible program, eSword Bible program. Uh, it's, it's free. And a lot of users create modules to plug into this to run and it's an excellent, excellent tool for learning Hebrew and doing word searches. And I, I've been using it for years and also creating modules for years because I've seen the importance of it as also a secular tool. Not only a religious tool, but a secular tool for comparing ancient Near Eastern texts and everything that relates to the Old Testament, mythology, Greek plays, uh, philosophy, all that. And I created modules and put it all together. And so I can compare and contrast 
biblical literature along with what was being uh, thought about in the literature and in society, and, and it works great. So if you go to esword.com or .net, look it up. It's huge, right? It's been going on for years, and they have some excellent stuff. And if you can't find a module, uh, ask somebody. Uh, they can loan it, loan it to you, um, free to use. Uh, there are some legal mon modules out there that you know you can legally download and, and buy. I would encourage you to do that uh, because they, they run great. You can do comparisons, there's dictionaries, all kinds of stuff. And you can really get into Hebrew word meanings. They got a bunch of different kinds of uh, Hebrew dictionaries, Greek dictionaries, uh, Hebrew text, uh, linear versions, linear translations with Strong's hooked up to it and uh, some other ones. Excellent. So, so that's what I, I use mainly when I do biblical research, and it, it ends up making things a lot easier when you do these word searches. Because sometimes when you do a word search in English, it doesn't filter in everything as if you did it with the Hebrew word. And sometimes there's the same Hebrew word for multiple meanings of words. So you get all those too, and then you can see what you're actually looking at. So when you say slavery is mentioned in the Bible this many times, you know, you should probably be looking up the different words, you know, meaning slavery or slave, and then comparing and contrasting those also in the Hebrew format, in the Hebrew language. Uh, so that program makes it easier to do, the sort Bible program. So I, I think the main problem, and hang on a second. The main problem for a lot of people is that they try to bring ancient Near Eastern literature, uh, which is in the Bible, uh, because it's a belief system, and, and make it relevant in their lives today. And that can be done. However, there are some things that obviously need to be left behind and only taken in context of maybe what was happening in the time period. So, say for example, uh, you looked up slavery in the Bible in the Old Testament, and if you looked at other ancient Near Eastern texts, say the Hammurabi Law Code on slavery, uh, you would have mention of a lot of the same types of things you find in biblical literature. And, and even in um, the uh, Iliad and Odyssey, if you read Hecuba, the, um, the play by, I believe it was by, uh, by Euripides, uh, which is you know, about the Trojan women, or, or Hecuba, the queen, after Troy was taken, how she knows she's going to be a servant. I believe she went to uh, Agamemnon, I think. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, and um, she knew that she would be abused. And Yuri Clara in uh, the Odyssey, who was the uh, nurse of Odysseus's son, Telemachus, she was given as a present to Odysseus. So, you know, it, in the context of the ancient Near East and the Greek world and all that, uh, they are no different and have no different views of slaves and law codes and things like that than any other uh, nation had at that time. It was all slice and dice. So when I see slavery in the Bible, I don't have a problem with it at all. I'm like, oh, I'm reading ancient Near Eastern text that in context makes sense to me because that was how things are, are run. And there is no sense in going back and rewriting history. And there is no sense in apologists trying to smooth it out. It's there. We need to look at it. We need to understand, you know, a little bit about why it happened, what's happening, that's important, and how the whole thing was viewed and what they did with slaves. And, and one question I, I just had the other day, reading Numbers, uh, when they uh, went to Holy War, it was, a, it was a war of revenge, I believe, against the Moabites, they conquered the Moabites, and they took Moabite women. And the priests say, hey, what about the Moabite women? What are they doing here? I thought, you know, kill all the Moabite women who have slept with men, but keep only the ones who have not slept with men that are young. So they kill off all the older women. So, so that was 
in, in Holy War, it was a, a revenge war. So there's different types of wars. There's different types of Holy War codes. And in that particular text, we have an ancient Near Eastern document of how things were broken down, the spoils of war, and were taxed by the temple and by the priestly caste, what they got. And, and so I had a question about, and maybe somebody could search this, what happened to the, the slaves that went, the women slaves, that were paid as a tax to the to the temple. You know what did they do? Uh, because if in the in the in the law code, if you're a stranger, you can't approach the, the tent meeting. Uh, you would be you'd be killed. So you need to keep that pure. Slaves also were, were a problem. So you integrate slavery in, and Judaism is extremely uh, worried about assimilation and views that are not of its own being integrated into cult, the culture and the belief system that could not happen so a lot of the purging that happened was to uh, was were anti-assimilation uh, purgings and also when you get slaves and when you conquer folks there was forced assimilation into the culture so we see david and uh the hittite who fought for David uh, ended up following Jewish law and Jewish rule according to Holy War code and going against even what the king said. So he was fully integrated into the society. It, it, it's, it's very amazing. So so that's, that's on that whole scale. And, and what I want to do is not just talk about it, give examples. So, so I looked up, you can, you can do this yourself. You know, you look up Hammurabi's law code. Uh, there's some Hittite law codes out there. Uh, so, so here's a, here's a few out of the law code of Hammurabi. Uh, this is uh, roughly about 1792 to 1750 uh, BCE. Uh, Rule 14. If anyone steal the minor son of another, he shall be put to death. Rule 15. If anyone take a male or female slave of the court, or a male or female slave of freed men outside the city gates, he should be put to death. So, so these laws here are just as fierce as the Hebrews. If anyone find a runaway slave, slaves in the open country, bring them to their masters. The master of the slave shall pay him two shekels of silver. Rule 18. If the slave will not give the name of the master, the finder shall bring him to the place. A further investigation must follow, and the slave should be returned to his master. Rule 19. If he holds the slave in his house, and they are caught there, he shall be put to death. Rule 20. If the slave that he caught ran away from him, then he shall answer to the owners of the slave, and he is free of blame. And then, once you get up into the hundreds, uh, there's law code uh, 117, 118, 119 that deals with that. And you can look at that. It's excellent. And there's an excellent book out comparing all this stuff. And, and it's a little bit pricey. Uh, I got it as a gift. But it's called Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament uh, by, by James Pitchard. And it was an excellent study. Egyptian texts, Hittite texts, Babylonian texts, Epic of Gilgamesh, all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, and after, in the end, I'm going to go over this video. So, so I guess it's important to look at it from a historical perspective. And then once you get into the metaphor and the religious, uh, look at it that way too, but with a grain of salt. Like, don't beat yourself up over it. And, and once you get into the uh, Christian aspect of it, Christianity, and Paul's talking about slave to, to Jesus and Christ and all that, Plato would say, become a slave to virtue and justice. And if the Apostle Paul, uh, seeing Christ as the highest form of virtue and the highest form of justice, then become a slave to that. And that is the best thing to be a slave to. A slave to justice and a slave to virtue itself. Beautiful. So, so that's why I don't really have any issues with uh, ancient Near Eastern views of slavery. It was horrible. Yes, but it happened, and it was the uh, MO of the way things were done. 
So, now to the second part. Uh, anyways, of the letter. Anyways, I wanted to know if you, if you could help this confused Christian on some questions about Judaism, religion in general. No, this is not a setup for an argument. I really want to know what you think, if I can get my head around some things. One, is slavery immoral in the context of the ancient world? No. Uh, it's not immoral. Uh, two, bondservant, maidservant, slaves are basically the same thing, right? No. Uh, I believe that certain law codes had certain categories for certain things. And um, because everything was strictly, uh, especially in biblical literature, strictly regulated. Now, biblical literature, yes. Maybe some other cultures, it might not make a difference. But if it's strictly regulated, there are certain things and certain classifications for almost everything. So I would look into that. I would look into that. But right now, I'm going to say no. They're, they were not the same thing. How do Jews view God? Do they consider him moral as we term? Uh, I got any more research on that. There's probably a hundred different opinions on that, like in Christianity and in other belief systems uh, about if God's moral or how, how we view that and, and the study of that and the philosophy of that. But I think it ends up being that they do consider him moral because he's the highest being. And even when it appears to man that he that the divine being is immoral or unjust, uh, he in fact still is, and we just don't understand it. So, so that's the way they get around that, at least you know the Christians. But I would like Judaism to speak for itself on that. You can probably uh, there's some probably really good websites that you could ask that question, especially uh, kabod.org. Uh, which is a really good website. Can you recommend any um, exegesis? E X G E T I C A L. I can't say that word right. I, I can never say that word. Uh, study Bibles or commentaries? Yes, I can. So, one is the, if you want a liberal translation, if you're a lib, darn libs, um, you would get the Jewish Study Bible. And uh, the Tanakh translation and commentary, this has plenty of scholarship in it from uh, modern scholars uh, who work in the field and also uh, modern theologians that are a little bit more liberal. Now, if you want the conservative version, uh, you would get the Art Scroll Tanakh uh, with study notes. And that's not bad. You could get the little study Bible. Uh, it's about yay big. Got it on my shelf in there. I, I forgot to bring it out. Sorry. Um, which is great because it gives the Orthodox Jewish view of a lot of the texts, well, actually all the texts in the Tanakh, and it's a great, great read. So I use that one for the conservative translation to say, okay, how do modern-day believers and, and Rebbe's think about this right now, and how did they come to think about that the way they do now? And I read that. So, so, and then I read the Lib translation for the more uh, controversial ideas that come out and the things that people are arguing about. Because you wouldn't want things that people are arguing about uh, in biblical literature. Unless it was a question on, uh, you know, what it was saying or the meaning of a text. Uh, these are uh, the theories, the theories about it. Because the rabbis like to argue over literature. There's nothing more they like to do. Uh, so, some books on ancient Near Eastern literature. As I mentioned before, ancient Near Eastern texts relating to the Old Testament. And also, Myths from Mesopotamia, Creation and the Flood of Gilgamesh and Others by Stephanie Daly. Love this book. Excellent. Uh, you can pick it up for, I think it's like 12 bucks online. Might be cheaper than that. Get the digital version. You can search it. Also, I wanted to jump in and um, say, get a subscription to Biblical Archaeology Review. Uh, excellent stuff. You can get the history for like 30 bucks. 36 bucks a year, a little bit pricey, but with that, you can get the digital version, download it to your phone or read it on your iPad. That's what I do. And it um, has all this stuff in here, man. Great stuff. So it's not only biblical literature. So so I just pulled this one. Uh, why was Moses' serpent destroyed? Um, and then right on the inside, too, it has historic Homer, did it happen? And a lot of the findings they found in you know Greek culture and the city possibly uh, being owned by... Uh, the Greeks who fought maybe at Troy and uh, archaeology done in different places 
excellent. So in that, it, it's packed. Look at this. This is, this is a great of, uh, armor, Greek armor. Awesome. And, um, man, there's a whole text on the uh, shield and armor of Achilles and the Iliad. If you ever get a chance to read that, it's, it's gorgeous. So I would do that, and then I already mentioned Eastward. Uh, also, for uh, books, is uh, Ancient Israel Myths and Legends. So if you think about it in a secular context, and not only in a theological, spiritual context, uh, there's plenty that you can learn. And also, uh, uh, a lot of biblical scholars that wrote the Anchor Bible Commentary. Uh, so pick those commentaries up. They're, they're great. Um, for New Testament, uh, Bar Ehrman's textbooks. Bar Ehrman's are very controversial, but his textbooks are really good. And uh, when he's not talking about the different issues, uh, he's excellent at early church history, lost Christianities, uh, lost scriptures. Uh, those are two books that gives the introduction of how the Bible was formed. Uh, the New Testament and early Christian writings, a reader. So this is excellent. If you pick this up, I, I got it off uh, eBay for, I don't know, let's see here the price. Uh, I don't know, it was used. You can buy a lot of the stuff used. It went out broken, it got on white. Buy it used, find them at yard sales. Uh, also, uh, his book, uh, The New Testament, uh, Historical Introduction to the Early Christian Writings by uh, Bart Ehrman. And then, of course, he wrote um, uh, Misquoting Jesus in the book that was very popular and now book Bart Ehrman likes writing books but um uh this text these textbooks were great introduction to critical thinking in the New Testament and critical uh analysis of the New Testament goes over a lot of the leading scholars what they argue about uh, early history of the church all kinds of stuff so Bart Ehrman says and, and here's the difference here's how you can wrap your head around this a lot of people tend to use apologist work. Believers gravitate towards apologist works uh, when trying to understand New Testament. Is some of that relevant? Yes, because it's the way that we interpret it. And how we interpret things is, is called pressure. How we apply things to our, our daily lives, what we read in scripture, and then reinterpret that scripture and make it into everyday uh, usage or predictions. And a lot of times, uh, their theological bias end up ruining it because they, they want to remade orthodox. And sometimes they become a slave to that orthodox and they have a hard time challenging it. But Arma could care less. Now, he has his own system that he's pretty loyal to, granted. Everybody does, right? But he's agnostic. So he's kind of like talking to the ex-wife of a criminal. Like, if you want to know anything about a criminal, you talk to the ex-wife. So a lot of times I learned about belief system from ex-members. You know, they're excellent. They sing like songbirds, man. They'll tell you everything you want to know about it. You know, and they, they may make up stuff, right? Make it sound terrible. But at least you get the general idea uh, of what it is. And you can kind of wrap your head around it better. Also, don't think about it, uh, especially Old Testament stuff, as, you know, this one thing that was supposed to be perfect. Uh, they were Hebrew tribes making their way in the ancient Near Eastern environment. And when they come into contact with the Sea Peoples, the Philistines, uh, the Amorites, the Malachites, and all the other ites, they dealt with them in ways that any other nation would. And if you look at it as, okay, these people aren't constantly being punished, they're just being taken over by bigger nations, Look at it from that perspective, you know, and uh, that'll help out a lot, too, so, so the historical. So what I wanted to say about apologists, Bart Ehrman said it great in, in one of his debates online, was that an apologist is nothing more than an evangelist disguised as a historian, right? So if somebody is teaching you history to get you to convert, they're not historians. They're apologists. Big difference. So, read history. And read the actual works. You have access to so much stuff nowadays. Everything's online. I don't need to read a commentary about Herodotus. I can read Herodotus and then read the commentary and see what those people think. 
And a lot of times, everything is up for hypothesis and theories about things, and there's many different ideas and scholars debate all the time, and it's awesome. So, um, I took a long time on that. Question five. Was it your study of the scriptures themselves that made you doubt? No. Um, it was realizing I was a fundamentalist, and I didn't want to be called that. And I realized that my views were extreme, and I read uh, Power of the Myth by Joseph Campbell and Myths to Live By. And I took a religion course at college. It was like an intro course, and a very dynamic uh, teacher, professor, uh, who taught that. And she recorded tapes of everything, so if I missed it, I could go to the library and listen. Um, and it wasn't a paid course that I paid for. Uh, she allowed anybody in her to come into her classes and listen for free. It was awesome. So, so while I was in the art major program, I was an art major, uh, my first two years of college for the base foundation, I got a BFA in art. Um, I was able to sit in on these religion classes. It, it just took off. And me and my buddy Richard, uh, we got into a debate with the Baptists and lost. Then we realized we needed to really spruce up on our uh, knowledge of history and textual criticism, all that kind of stuff. And it just blew up from there. And um, I really would like to get my buddy Richard on at some point. He's doing a huge, huge study on the beginnings of the occult and ideas about uh, how the whole satanic and satanism thing uh, happened from way early all the way up until now. Pulp fiction, everything. I just was visiting him last month and he's got another year on the project. He actually wants to publish some of this stuff and he showed me some presentations that he actually gave to a class about it and um, it, it was excellent. And uh, when, when you look at the scope of the whole thing and the history of the whole thing, uh, you realize that a lot of it was uh, a sham started by charlatans who wanted to make a quick buck on frightening people. And it worked. It's awesome. Um, John Todd watched some of his stuff. He couldn't stop doing it until he was found out. Evangelical churches would uh, have him come in and talk about the Illuminati, and it was never ending, right? So uh, that whole thing, it's excellent. But I, I think that looking at world religion, I didn't want to label myself as atheist because I, I know it's all on labels, and, and I very well may be an atheist, but I love the literature so much, and I realized the value from reading Joseph Campbell, the power of the myth, and the metaphor and what it meant to people to use his tools to get through life and, and, and interpret things. Uh, and, and the beauty of literature, and the beauty of storytelling, and, and the whole symbolism and ideas from Carl Jung and other people like that, who believe that belief can play a very important role in people's lives. So, hopefully I answered some questions. Man, I did drone on, but then uh, just, uh, it's been a while. So, take care, friends, and remember, everybody's thinking alike. And somebody isn't thinking.